Armin Kurlopian has joined me for the interview. Thank you for joining us. Absolute pleasure to be here. So you're a chief scientist. This is the first time that science, scientific institutions are presented at Digitech Expo. How do you see the science and tech cooperation in Armenia? Science and tech is really strategic for our country. If we consider the importance for Armenia, we have a few important implications. Uh, the first is economic growth. So very similar to Estonia, a country with only two million people, was able to generate 10 startup unicorns, specifically science and technology-based ventures that help strengthen its economy. So for Armenia, that opportunity is very exciting and I'm most delighted to see increased activity as per our conference today. And we've, I've mentioned we've seen scientific institutions here, we see the tech startups, we see the companies. Do you think that after this event ends, there will be a cooperation? Because sometimes during events like this, people usually talk about it, but then we don't see the results. So if we consider a specific example, we just came from a fantastic session held by Granitus Ventures, the first venture capital firm in Armenia. And one of the, the companies that presented is De Novo Sciences, which uses algorithms, so specifically mathematics that are science-based, in this case biology, to develop medical products to shorten the development time for something that could be life-saving. So if we consider that entire link, something coming from the laboratory, being embedded into a company's product and being launched to the market, it's very exciting. So yes, I think we'll be seeing more of this. During my previous interviews, when I asked my guests, representatives of the tech industry, about deep tech, tar deep tech startups in Armenia, uh, and when I asked about the development of the deep tech startups in Armenia, the one um, thing that they mentioned was uh, the role of educational institutions, which is crucial for having deep tech startups and growing them. How do you think is the situation with the educational system and the, as a result, the startups that later you know, outside the conference hall, it was really inspiring to see the, the two more boxes. So if we consider the core education as well as after school programs, I believe that's really important. So there's definitely positive movement there. Uh, importantly with education, there is actually an intersection with culture because there is direct knowledge, but scientific innovation is about discovery. And discovery by definition means something new. So we need both technical content and we need problem solving courage, namely to smash the status quo that exists in many facets of industries and in many components of society. You've been born and raised in the US and now you're moving between New York and Armenia. I want to see I want to ask you, how do you see the differences of Armenian growing tech ecosystem and what is already established and developed there? And do you feel that the Armenian tech ecosystem has where to go and like it's going on the right way? Yes, yeah, so to your kind question, I was born in the, the US and have done work in uh, parts of the Middle East, parts of Europe, parts of Asia and it's so strategic where Armenia is. And to this item on uh, accelerating the ecosystem, there's something distinctive in the US uh, that does not exist. It's called the tall poppy syndrome, uh, which exists in many parts of the world. Namely, if there's something that shoots up or grows, there's this tendency for it to be cut down. It exists almost everywhere on the planet. And for a startup ecosystem uh, to emerge, whether that's in Israel, Estonia, or Armenia, that ability to shoot up is really important. So that comes to mind as an important area for us to consider, where things are thought to be possible as opposed to not possible. Uh, as an example, I serve on the scientific advisory board for one of NASA's institutes. 
the Translational Research Institute for Space Health, a collaboration across the Baylor College of Medicine, across Caltech and MIT. For the board, scientific advisory board meetings of Trish, I've taken those from Armenia. So this is the first time ever such an exchange has happened uh, for that type of organization. So these things are possible and these international connections are very important. When you said that for countries like Armenia, it's important that we have startups or companies that can, that shoot up, for, I mean, if, in our example, we have some very successful, a few very successful startups. But don't you think that when you have like three, four very successful startups uh, and then the rest are not that successful, are not that high, it seems like that the industry has froze somehow or the growth has slowed down. But in fact, there might be companies that are still going, but it's not meant for everyone to just go that high. So two important points, and thank you so much for this question. One is we still want to emphasize this strategy because of the relative size of the economy. Currently, Armenia's GDP is approximately gross domestic products, 15 billion. If we can have 10 startup unicorns that go from zero to one billion in value, all of a sudden you have these high tech, innovative companies in healthcare, in finance, in security that become a very valuable part of the economy. To the second point, well, what happens to all the, the smaller ones? Well, that's an opportunity for M&A, mergers and acquisitions. So it's this idea that teams can start merging behind the most successful ones. And this is a great strategy to relieve pressure on the labor market. Uh, moreover, companies can also do targeted recruiting. There are Armenians in Beirut, in Buenos Aires, in Montreal, would be, could be recruited back to Armenia, as well as, as we discussed earlier, continued education to provide high-level workforce for these companies that increase the economy and, by extension, boost security. And you've said that, that it's an opportunity for the new ones, the ones that are just starting their work, their career, but um, it gets harder and har harder day by day to think of something new, to create something new, and especially for countries like Armenia and startups from countries like Armenia. So how do you see the environment that the Armenian startups grow? Is it... Um, does it have favorable conditions for them to be that high because it gets harder and harder by time? You know, there's great foundational items around mathematics, around electronics, around even history with chess. Uh, you have very hard problems that are able to be solved here. The key though is having this belief that things are possible and to make earnest collaborations. So one important skill that you can't quite learn in university is the skill of following up. It's not enough just to reach out one time. An entrepreneur, a scientist needs to follow up to make sure that their innovation sees the light of day. You know, when I arrived to Armenia, I would hear something, you know, quite peculiar to my ear that uh, you know, ah, the scientists are not, you know, having a much focus put on them. They're not able to secure much salary. It's a very strange concept because a scientist, a laboratory leader, part of their job is to bring resources and prestige to their home institution. The challenge is that part of the scientific discipline uh, did not exist in previous times. So it's not a question of remembering, it's a question of learning how to do something. So if we have this focus on science, on education, around getting that intellectual property into ventures that can grow and create jobs, strengthen the tax base, can make strong international connections, we'll not only have those valuable entities, but the training of that experience, of that shooting up, uh, which can also improve leadership across the country. 
That was a really good point you made when you said that part of scientists' job is bringing resources. But I think you know maybe better than me that that's not the case in Armenia. And I don't think that many scientists think like that. How do you make it, make that thought, that belief to them? It comes back to if you want your innovation to be seen, if you want your research to scale and be more impactful, there needs to be networking with international colleagues and organizations. There needs to be collaboration and leverage on scientific instrumentation and follow-up. That follow-up is so important because a scientist as a laboratory leader has to look after their team. And that also means securing resources. Well, how do you do that? You need grant writing capability, networking with companies in terms of sponsored research, and also for the universities to understand you don't provide a professor just their salary. They need to be funded with what's known as a lab startup package, a budget that includes their salary, two postdocs, a set of students. After three to five years, that scientist must be bringing in resources to the country and the university or the institute to make the whole process sustainable. As for scientists, I have always wondered how do they choose on what to work because we have these discussions a lot that people are saying that the scientists in Armenia need to focus on solving the problems that exist in Armenia, the challenges that we, we face daily. And also there is this opposite opinion that you should think global and if you want to survive in global market, if you want to compete in global scale, you should uh, try to solve global problems. How do they choose? How does that work? I would say there is an intersection with the dichotomy in your question. There are certain international questions that are also strategic to Armenia. Let's take, for example, having a carbon neutral economy. If Armenia as a case study could not have reliance on oil or national gas, that is of high interest geopolitically in the country as well as a model for countries around the world. Uh, recently, Greece ran its entire grid on renewable energy just for a few hours as a marquee case study. So challenges around the environment, sustainability uh, are both locally important and internationally important. I think that the big part of Armenian startups and tech companies are kind of focused on AI, but I want to learn uh, what tendencies do you see? What are the next big things that the Armenian startups and the ones that are just creating can focus on in order to succeed? Yeah, AI itself is a massive topic. Uh, I remember seeing a session with Gary Kasparov and he teased the audience said, you know, you ask 10 experts in AI for a definition, you will get 20 answers. And so if we can break that apart, there's a very important part of artificial intelligence known as machine perception. So for example, teaching a computer to see vis-a-vis -vis computer vision or teaching a computer to hear via computer audition. So in computer vision, we have two Armenian healthcare robotics companies that have made it to Time magazine. It's Embodied, Moxie the Robot, and Robin the Robot by Expert. There's also Skyla, where I sit as a board director, using computer vision not to drive a car, but to provide physical security. For example, the camera and processing behind it, enabling detection of someone presenting a firearm or a knife, or two people fighting, or someone falling. So even within AI, if we are very targeted in these industry important areas, like social robotics for the world, physical security for Armenia and beyond, uh, we can make quite, quite a difference. You know, outside of AI, there's key needs in terms of green energy sources, and to reduce carbon emissions requires not only the carbon accounting, 
but also competition of green products. Uh, as a simple example, you know, in buildings today, there's gas that goes into the, the stovetop. Part of that is history, but you can make actually an electric stovetop that is better than a gas one. You don't have the leaks, it makes the food very nice, but that requires product innovation because currently most electric stovetops don't give you a good experience. So the question is, well, if we can engineer those products here, we can engineer social robotics here, we can develop algorithms here, we can offer something that not only propels the society locally forward, but it makes a difference for the world. But do we have the capacity to engineer and develop? Because yesterday I was talking to Ashwad Vartanian and he told me that they have this joke around founders when they say they are 500 Armenian founders and only 50 developers. So this gets back to this idea of, and this is a point of view I convey to startups I invest in, is if you are too small for too long, a correct course of action is to do mergers and acquisition. Join with other teams, get acquired. That's not a sign of defeat, it's a t sign of moving forward. Because we can't afford to have our talents locked up in these very, 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 very small companies. Uh, we need larger ones. So uh, that's a very important consideration that mergers and acquisitions is, is really important. In terms of uh, the, like the cap of startups, Estonia with only a population of two million, including its diaspora, has had 10 startup unicorns. So companies zero to a billion in, in value. Uh, we have Service Titan and Pixar, and we have a set coming along the way behind them. So we are by still no means near our saturation point. And when you talked about unicorns, when Pixar uh, became a unicorn in 2021, I guess, there were many talks about the following others that will follow right after, but it sort of slowed down and now it seems like we no one is like near. How do you think the situation is with that? So we are very similar situation in Armenia to that of uh, Estonia in 2004 in terms of its economic size, in terms of potential for growth. A key thing the ecosystem has not had yet is we have not had a unicorn exit. And this is really important. That exit event provides liquidity for the early employees, which then start other companies. So we still have not had that moment yet, and we're very excited to support that. I do that vis-a-vis -vis the BAJ Accelerator, which I've co-founded. We have trained 104 companies. Six are on their way to becoming unicorns, and we are not slowing down. So this is the motion, and I'm quite optimistic once we have that event like Skype was for Estonia, things will pick back up. And my last question is about the Digitech. I want to ask you, after these two days of Expo and Summit, what are your opinion, what is your opinion about it and did your expectations, did you meet your expectations? You know, if we consider Digitech in the arc of key events, you know, there was the World Congress of IT. We have, over these last few days, the Expo and the Summit. These events are really important to make international ties, to welcome guests, for for folks to be invited to different cities and specifically to help secure capital, content, and customers, which are key inputs for Ventures growth. So I'm delighted all of that is happening at the Digitech this year as well. Thank you very much for the interview. Pleasure.